the two demons, after they got done hooking me up, um, they backed away from me. They didn't turn around and back away. They were looking at me, walking backwards, making, they, they got pleasure out of just looking at me, knowing that I was totally helpless, knowing that I could not get out of there. They knew that, and that gave them such pleasure. And as the fire of hell was, was roaring, glowing about me, I could see the outline, and it was a massive audience of all sorts of deformities of demons. And um, all I could see were their shadows, and I kept looking. And I wanted to scream for help, but I didn't even have the energy to do that because I knew I was doomed. I just, I just knew I was doomed. Hello, my name is Alice Cloud. I'm an enrolled Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. And um, I'm so glad you came across Precious Testimonies to hear uh, the testimony of, of my life. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ be given all the praise and, and honor and glory for what I'm about to tell you. And the reason why I'm giving you my testimony is because as Native people, I'm sure you can relate to me, uh, the troubled upbring that we have as Indian people. But through Jesus Christ, we can have the victory to overcome. And um, you've been watching a series of testimonies in, in my home, and I welcome you today to uh, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I wanted to uh, uh, start out by uh, praying very quickly. And uh, Father God, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your blood. I thank you for uh, dying on the cross for me, Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm unworthy of, of your love, Lord, but Lord, you just reign in my life. And I thank you, Father, for thy faithfulness and for thy greatness, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would use me for your glory and for your benefit, Lord. Father, I thank you for, for caring for me, Lord. I thank you for, for being my best friend, and I thank you for, for loving me for who I am and for, for who I am about to become. Lord, you deserve all of the glory. Amen. I wanted to start out very quickly with um, a little paragraph uh, from... Uh, Dr. Billy Graham had said this in 1976 about us Native people. And it goes, The greatest moments of Native history may lie ahead of us if a great spiritual renewal and awakening should take place. The Native American has been a sleeping giant. He is awakening. The original Americans could become the evangelists who will win America for Christ. Remember these people. Praise God. And it is now the year 2009. And us Native people are still here. And I praise God that he has not forgotten the Native American people. We are the original Americans. And I praise God for that. The Lord Jesus has not forgotten us. And if you would just invite him be willing to be open to the testimony that I'm going to give you. You're going to know that Jesus Christ is real and that he loves you. There's no mistake at all that you're watching this uh, precious testimony uh, today. And I pray that you would receive it with grace in Jesus' name. Well, as I told you, I'm Ho-Chunk and I'm also Chippewa. My parents are Lionel and Judy Cloud. My dad is, an, is enrolled Ho-Chunk, and my mother is, was enrolled in the Grand Travis Band of the Chippewa Odawa Indians in uh, Peshabi Town, Michigan. I grew up in Baraboo, Wisconsin, on an old farmhouse. This farmhouse was 100 years old, if not more. We had no running water. And uh, sometimes we would even go without electricity. And we had an old uh, outhouse. I have uh, 
six brothers and sisters, so I came from a very large family. I grew up near Devil's Lake in Baraboo, Wisconsin, but I was born in Northport, Michigan. Um, as some of you native people can, can relate, I had a pretty uh, tragic childhood, a hard one. And it's not easy to talk about, but I know a lot of you native people know what I'm talking about, the pain, the suffering, the low self-esteem. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ can take all of that pain and, and hurt just like that if you would let him. As I was telling you, I grew up in this house. It had a it was a two story home and we had lots of barns. My dad Lionel moved uh mobile homes for a living and we also had a, a junkyard. My mother worked at a factory, so us kids, we were never without food. My parents did the best that they could to take care of us. But there's also trouble in the home as well. I was uh, the baby girl of the family, so my sisters and I, we had to take care of the three boys. They were babies then. It's kind of hard to do when you want to go outside and play, you know, but you got to you got to stay indoors and you got to help take care of the little ones, you know. And uh, since we didn't have running water, my mom would have to sneak to the Devil's Lake campground. She would take these, uh, these milk cans and she would fill them up with water at the campground. We had to hurry up and uh, get water before security came. They caught us more than several times and they told us never to come back. So we had to sneak in there just to get water to drink. And we would also my mom would um tell us kids to hurry up and um take a shower in the um campground. She always bring along a bar of soap. She would have some shampoo and she would say, you girls, you got to hurry up and take a shower. Help your brothers. So we would go in there and take showers. I remember being scared because I didn't want to get caught by the campground security. So we would hurry, you know, and do what we had to do. And we got out of there. And those milk cans were real heavy. It was hard for my mom to lift those, and being so small, I always wish I could help her lift those cans, but I couldn't. So we would go home, and sometimes uh, my dad would come home drunk, you know, and uh, that's when he would uh, beat on my mother a lot. My mother was a, a Christian. She loved the Lord Jesus Christ very much. She uh, always tried to bring peace into the home. But my dad, he was always so rebellious against Christianity. He had a hard upbringing too. But uh, she was always praying, you know, for him. So, anyway... Um, Growing up on that that farm, it was a lot of fun. I would uh, jump into the old the junk cars and I would play in them. You know, I was always outside too. And if I wasn't watching my brothers, I was outside playing. And um, I would go in these junk cars and I would find just little stuff to play with all the time. And um, anyway, to get out of the house, my mother put us kids in a Awana club in church. Awana club is a is a like a Sunday school for kids, and that's how I was raised. I was raised knowing about Jesus Christ, and for me, it was in a way to escape uh, reality, because my dad would beat my mom a lot, and I had to be a witness to that. And there's also some sexual 
abuse with my older sister that she had to endure, and that was difficult to witness too. And um, but you know, uh, Jesus was was with me the whole time, and somehow I I knew that I I didn't know how, but I I just knew that Jesus was with me. And um, so anyway, I grew up in the Baraboo area. It was an all white school. It was very difficult going to an all white school when you're very, very poor. And I'm talking, I had two pairs of pants. They had holes in them. It was tough going to school like that and facing these, these rich kids, you know. It was hard. But I didn't care. I just, all I ever wanted to do was just go to school and um, graduate. That was my goal in my life. So, growing up, uh, out in Baraboo there, my, my dad would come home and he would start beating on my mom. And I remember this rage of hate would overcome me and I would want to kill him. And I wanted to stop him. And I used to, as he was hitting her, I would have thoughts of just killing my dad. She was a good person. I remember one time I I jumped on him on his back and I was pulling his hair and I told him to leave mom alone. He just pushed me off. So when my dad would beat on my mom he would also hit my little brothers. <laughs> and my older brother, he's uh, mentally retarded, you know. He was born that way with a disability. And I used to see my dad hit my little brother. I remember then crying out to God, when is this going to end? When are you, when are you going to do something about it? I always had that hope that he was going to do something about it as small as I was. And when my dad wouldn't stop hitting my mom, I would run to a <coughs> a tree in back of our house. I'd run up that tree and I'd just close my ears and I would just rock back and forth and I would pray that the Lord would just take me to another place because I could still, still hear them yelling at each other in the kitchen. And I used to be so mad. I thought, why can't I just be a normal kid? Why can't, why can't I just be normal. How come my dad has to hit my mom like that? Why does he have to do that to her? I loved my mom, you know. I loved my dad too, but I could never understand why he would do those kind of things to her. So, when he would be done hitting her, I would stay stay up in that tree for a half hour and I would climb back down and I needed to know if my mommy was okay. I didn't know if she was dead or alive, you know. So I got brave and I would tiptoe into the house and I would see my mommy picking up the mess. I used to feel so bad for her, you know. I used to blame myself that I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough to help her around the house. Maybe it was my fault. And I would say, Mom, are, are you okay, Mom? And she'd say, yeah, I'm okay. 
Her eyes would be really red. <sighs> a couple of times when he would beat on her, she asked me to dial 911. He, one time he, he looked at me and he says, if you call the cops, he says, I'll kill her. I just remember looking at him and I just knew he was too powerful. I, I just knew it. So I had to sit there and watch him beat my mom. So, anyway, I had to go to school with, with this type of upbringing, and it wasn't easy. I had a lot of anger in me as a child. I had lots of anger, and as I got older, um, I wasn't raised around powwows, you know. My mother was a Christian, and uh, we didn't have money, you know. So I wasn't raised around the powwow scene like some of the other native children were and um we were pretty much kept to ourselves out there by Baraboo there and uh going to school was was hard you know because I was poor and um all the kids were I know a lot of those kids were better off than I was you know and I used to get called names a lot for for being native and uh my my older sister was sexually abused and she uh, moved out of the home and I remember him beating on her a lot too and uh, there was nothing that I could do but I always talked to the Lord you know why did it why did he have to do things like that to her and um, so anyway as I got to be a, a teenager I um, dedicated my life to Satan and I started heavily going into the use of the occult and um, I worshiped the devil with all of my heart my mind and my soul and he was my God and uh, the as I was getting heavily into that the spiritual gifts that I have now as a Christian I also have them um, as being a devil worshiper, I, I had those same giftings, and uh, I would have dreams and visions as well, and um, I saw things that were horrible. Um, but I asked the devil for for power, and I I uh, was heavily into uh, the Ouija board and um, just talking to Satan. I did a lot of that to him, and so anyway, I um. Thank you. I was uh, worshiping the devil quite a bit, and uh, I would even bow, you know, bow before him and told him that if he gave me more power that I would give him my soul in return. And um, my goal was to somehow uh, to make my dad quit hitting my mom, you know. And the only thought that came to my mind was to murder him. And I had thoughts of doing that to him. And um, I knew it wasn't right. And um, so I would talk to my mom about it, you know. So she was always taking me to church. And I would, always would hear the, the pastor talk of um, repentance and that hell was a real place. And I guess I, I didn't care. I think I at that age I was pretty callous. I didn't care where I went, if I went to heaven or hell. I just didn't care. I just knew that satanic worship was was a, an outlet for me to express my anger, and that I knew that Satan was totally in agreement with me that my dad needed to die, and uh, that's what I wanted to hear, and that's that's exactly what I heard, and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, and. Um, so as as I was heavily into satanic worship, uh, my mother knew it because I was dressing in black all the time, and other kids made fun of me in school, but um, I didn't care. And um, the more the kids made fun of me, um, I I just really did not care. 
I was in my own world and um, I wasn't going to school to make friends. I was just going going to school because I had to. And uh, my mother noticed a change in, change in me and she would always pray for me and she would cry too and she would say, you know, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to go to hell and I don't want you to go to hell. No daughter of mine, she says, is going to be worshiping the devil. But uh, I didn't care. I just did not care. And of course, my dad would start in on me too. And he's like, why are you wearing black all the time? And I'd be like, oh, because I totally hate you. I just hate you, you know. And I was always cursing him and being really mean to him. And I had no remorse. And so one time I, um, I had a dream and um, I took a nap in, in the afternoon, and as I was doing that, uh, I had a dream, and I was in hell, and I was in this this pit. This pit was perfect cir circular. I knew that circle was perfect. It was embebbled in the ground, and there was fire and brimstone in these bricks. These bricks were glowing red hot. That's how hot it was. I mean, it was so hot down there that those bricks, they glowed. And I remember looking to my left and I saw those bricks and I knew that it says in the scriptures about fire and brimstone. And uh, that's what those bricks were. I, mem I, I remember fire and brimstone. And as I was in hell, there were three demons um, assigned to me and I knew that. And not only that, but there was a an audience. There were uh, detestable creatures. I couldn't make out their faces, but I saw their deformities in their body. And they looked really weird to me. And they were scary looking. And um, one of the two demons uh, hooked me up to these chains. They were chains that were hooked up to inside of the circle. And each of them stuck my hands in these chains. These chains were about an inch thick, and they were really wide band, and they clip, clip those on to me. And I remember looking at those chains, and the chains, I knew those chains were ancient. I knew many, 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 many people were hooked to these chains at one time, and I was just a number. And there were some flesh that were still left on those chains on each side of me. And I knew that I was going to get it. I just knew it. And they st stuck my each of my wrist against the walls of the chains. And those chains, they weren't little. They were massive. They were about probably this thick round. And they were heavy. I mean, they weren't light. It was, it was, it was just heavy. Where I just couldn't resist, but just to stick my arms out. Then each of the demons took a, took my um, my ankles and they put these uh, bands around my ankles and my legs were spread apart. So I had my arms spread apart and my legs spread apart. And I could hear the the other demons. They were cheering, cheering them on. They were like, yeah, yeah all right, you know, and they were clapping, and I was just looking at them. I couldn't feel the heat of hell. All I kept looking at was this creature coming towards me. So the two demons, after they got done hooking me up, um, they backed away from me. They didn't turn around and back away. They were looking at me, walking backwards, making, they, they got pleasure out of, just looking at me, knowing that I was totally helpless, knowing that I could not get out of there. They knew that, and that gave them such pleasure. And as the fire of hell was was roaring, glowing about me, I could see the outline, and it was a massive audience of all sorts of deformities of demons. And um, all I could see were their shadows, and I kept looking, and I wanted to scream for help, but I didn't even have the energy to do that because I knew I was doomed. I just, I just knew I was doomed, and I was ready to accept my punishment. And out of the crowd came the third demon that was assigned to me, 
This demon was probably, I want to say, 10 to 12 feet high. It was, its skin was, um, was red. I remember that. I don't know why his, his skin was so red, but it was like, like blood red. He was uh, muscular. He had like a six pack. He had horns, but it came back like this. It wasn't up like this, but it was back, back of his head. And um, he had like black lips and his teeth were like yellow and they were pointy and sharp. And he had gigantic wings, but his wings were battered. It looked like there was some, some, like something took a bite out of those wings. Like he was tortured himself. For what reason, I don't know. I didn't know at the time what, why those wings, they were so powerful, but yet they looked beaten, you know. And he had a long, long tail. And um, he had these massive, like three, three big fingers and they had claws that went like this at a curve and he was coming towards me um, he wasn't coming towards me boldly he was coming towards me at walking on the side on he was walking sideways and as he was walking he had this massive whip and he was going like this with it and hitting the uh, the ground with it and that was the only thing that I could hear in that pit was the sound of that whip. And on, I saw that whip, and on the end of the whip, there were like uh, some sort of a metal on each end of the, of the whip. And I remember just being there, and I was like, this is, I, I couldn't even close my eyes. I don't, I couldn't even do that. And I didn't want to look, but I had to look. I was forced to look. And um, as he was coming towards me, he was cracking that whip at me. All of a sudden, he raised his hand, and when he did, I, could, I looked out into the audience, and they were just as happy as they could be. He uh, whipped me, and he hit my leg, and that's when I woke up. And I was laying on my stomach from this nap, and I remember waking up and thinking, Oh, it's just a dream. <laughs> oh, my God, it's just a dream. Th oh, man, I was like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I mean, just imagine a devil worshiper saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. It was, it was just a dream. It's just a dream. Yes. But wait, I was laying there, and I was like, my leg still hurts. How come, how come that hurts like that? All of a sudden, I felt more pain, and I thought, what is that? And I tried to lift my leg and I couldn't lift it. And it felt like something heavy was on it. And I cried out to the Lord because I knew I was in trouble. And I was like, what's going on? God help me. And I got up and believe it or not, when I got up, there was a huge piece of plaster on my leg. And I looked up at my bedroom ceiling and plaster had fell from the ceiling and it hit my leg and I thought man that's weird so then when I took my leg out there was actually a, a, a whip mark on my leg and the Lord he says to me if you continue to do what you're doing that's where you're gonna go and I looked up and I said forgive me I don't I don't want to go there forgive me Lord <sighs> just forgive me father I I didn't I didn't mean to do that you know I I didn't mean to I didn't mean to do that to you so I got up and I was limping and I went downstairs you know and I ran down and I told my mom, I told her this dream. I said, Mom, guess what happened, you know? I said, uh, the Lord took me to hell, and I, I told her all about it, and she started to cry, and she was praising God that um, I didn't have to, um, that I gave up my my ways of being, um, of being a devil worshiper. So for a while, I started to walk with the Lord, but I fell out of it again, and 
started to to do my own thing and so anyway um my life did not change my dad was still doing things to my mother and um i started to hang out with the wrong type of kids at school you know i thought i knew it all and i started to um go out and drink and party one time i was uh i was really really drunk and i was sitting in the back seat and I was drinking with a bunch of uh, boys. And I was the only girl in the car. And the Lord said to me, uh, you need to get out of the car. And I was in the back seat, just drunk out of my mind. And I was like, what? He says, you need to get out of that car. Okay. I said, hey, I said, just drop me off right here. My friend Dennis, he's like, what? I said, just drop me off right here. He goes, why? I'll take you home. No, uh-uh. I, I got to get out of this car. He goes, man, he goes, you're just freaking out. I said, no, I'm not. I'm telling you, I need to get out of this car. All right. And he, he just dropped me off. And even when I, even though I was drunk, I praised the Lord. And I was like, I praise you. I, I don't know why I drink. I was telling the Lord, you know. But I walked home and I, I made it home okay. And, um... As I started to get older, you know, um, I got married. I fell in love with a, uh, an Aguala Lakota from Pine Ridge. He was the, the love of my life. And um, hmm. we got married, and that was the happiest day of my life. I loved my husband very, very much. And uh, we had a daughter together. But before we got married, uh, I, I already had another child. And um, so it was it was a happy time for all of us. And um, I was married for um, 11 years. And uh, so we, we got married and stuff, and we started to go to powwows. We would go to powwows even though we didn't have any money. We would still go because uh, we just love that that family time together and making new friends and stuff but still in the background the Lord kept trying to bring me back to him he kept trying to tell me to go to church he kept telling me to read the word but I'd be like maybe tomorrow but not today I'm busy and the Lord he still kept just tugging at my heart you know and so anyway uh, my mother uh, started to get sick you know uh, she kept complaining that her stomach would hurt, and I would be like, gosh, Mom, you better go to the doctor and find out what's wrong. And she finally did, and uh, they told her she had uh, cancer. So um, I knew in my heart that she was going to not recover. I knew she was going to pass on, but yet there was a part of me that was in denial, and uh, so much in denial that... Um, I didn't really want to be around her too much because it was too painful to think that this wonderful woman was, was going to die of cancer. So uh, my husband and I, we went to a powwow in uh, Tennessee. But before we left, my mother was admitted into the hospital. And when I walked into the hospital room, um, her legs were white, like op opaque white pantyhose. And I started to tease her, and I said, oh, Mom, those are really nice pantyhose they got you in. And she looked up at me, and she said, um, I'm not wearing any pantyhose. And I said, oh, what? God, that's disgusting. What? What? What's wrong with your legs? How come they're white? I'm like, so I'm like, doctor, you know, and she came over, and I said, doctor, how come her legs look white like that? She says, well, you know, we're, we're not sure. We're running all sorts of tests, but, you know, we're pretty confident that she's going to be okay. I'm like, well, Mom, you know, i got to go to Tennessee tomorrow for a powwow. And she's like, you go on ahead. She goes, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'm like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be getting out of the hospital, you know. And even then, my dad wasn't there for support either. I think it was too much for him, too, but. So anyway, we ended up going to this powwow in Tennessee. It was a long drive. It was probably about 14 hours. And I'm telling you, as soon as we got into the hotel room, because we were driving all night, we got in there with the two, our two girls, and we laid the two girls down on the bed, 
And my husband at the time, he laid down and he's like, oh, I just want to sleep. And I jumped on that bed and I was joking. And I was like, yeah, me too. I said, man, that was a drive. All of a sudden we got a phone call and we just both looked at each other. And my, my husband at the time said, um, gee, I wonder who that is. He goes, nobody knows we're here. I said, I know. I, I, and I started to tease and I said, oh, it's probably a, a bad phone call. So I picked up the phone and they said, is Alice, uh, is Alice there? And I said, yeah, this is Alice. And she says, well, I'm nurse, I'm nurse so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, I'm, I wanted to tell you that we have your mother um, at the University of uh, Madison Hospital and you need to come home immediately because she's not expected to make it through the night. And, uh, of course, I started to cry. And my husband uh, at the time took the phone away from me. And um, sure enough, uh, we had to drive right back. So as we were driving back, um, I kept begging. I kept begging Jesus, please, please don't let her die like this. Let me... Uh, make it make it back to Madison in time to say goodbye to her at least just just grant that to me and remember you know I wasn't walking with the Lord at the time I wasn't uh, I could have cared less you know I, I knew about the Lord but I wasn't walking with him so going 14 my uh, 14 hours back to Wisconsin was the most difficult time that I ever had just sitting still and being confined to a car knowing that your mother is dying and she could die at any given moment that was torture and um, I kept calling like every hour making sure she was still alive and my my grandmother's like where are you at you're supposed to be here shame on you for going to a powwow I'm like, Grandma, I didn't know, you know, Mom was, you know, and she's like, you need to get over here right now. And I'm like, I'm going as fast as we, you know, as fast as I can, Grandma, you know, and she was really getting after me. And I mean, that's just added misery on top of misery. Then my kids were crying and it was horrible. So when you go to Birmingham, I think it's Birmingham, Illinois or Indiana, they have this huge cross, you know. This, it's made out of metal and it's off on the highway and anybody can stop there and receive prayer and whatever. And I remember looking at that cross and I was like, Lord Jesus, I'm like, I, I just need you. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to cry out to you, you know. So I told my husband at the time, we need to pull over because I, I, I need to uh, talk to the Lord, you know. So he did. And, um. So we got in there and I just cried out to the Lord by myself and uh, I'm like, Father, please let my mother live and um, until I get there. So we finally got to the hospital. And as soon as I walked into the ICU unit, my little brother Sterling, he was probably around, I think, 17 he said to me, he ran up to me and he said, we're making plans right now to, um, to um, Ma's funeral. And I looked at him and I, f I fell. It was like I fainted. And everybody came rushing over. I couldn't even stand. And I thought, what? Oh my, oh my God, you know. I don't want to be talking about my mother's funeral, you know, you, geez, you know, I was like just dumbfound. So I saw people coming out of the ICU unit from her room and they're wearing these masks and gloves and they look like, they just looked like, um, I don't know, they, it just looked weird to me, you know, and they're like, hurry up, you know, uh, scrub your hands and and, and uh, put this mask on, put this gown on, you know, so I did that, and I kept thinking, God, I'm so scared, you know, I'm so scared of what I'm going to see, I'm so scared, and the Lord's like, I'm with you, I'm with you, and he was, I understand, and I was like, okay, so I put that gown on, and 
I went in there and I saw my mother and uh, she had tubes up in her and um, she was dying. And I went over by her and I didn't know where, where my dad was at the time. Um, I don't know where he was, but my whole family was there and everybody was crying. You know, it was, it was just so shocking. I never thought my mother was was going to die, you know, I just never thought about that, you know, and so I was looking at her and they told me that she had cancer in her, her lymph noids and that her, her kidneys were shutting down. That's why her legs were white. And, um, basically, uh, uh, her, her waste material was floating through her veins is what it was. And it was killing her. And, um, I cried out to the Lord with my brothers and sisters. We got into a circle and we asked Lord for mercy. And um, so she fell into a coma. And um, Madison is about an hour away from Wisconsin Dells. So financially that, that took a toll on my husband at the time and my children. And that was very difficult to make those trips for the gas. And um, because we had one car and at the time I was um, a stay at home mother. And so we had to uh, depend on grace and mercy from people that would give us gas money to go up there to go see her. And at the time I was going to school full time at the university and I was trying to get my teaching degree because I wanted to become a school teacher. And I remember sitting in those classes like every day I would I would go to classes. It'd be like. Um, Alice, you got a phone call. It's a hospital. And that was horrible because I'd be thinking, okay, my mother is dead. But they're like, well, you better come today because we don't know. She, we don't think she's going to make it. So I was like, oh man, how am I going to go to school? You know, it, it was horrible. And so then, um, they said that, uh, when I got to the hospital, uh, somehow she, she would always just turn out to be okay. And I knew it was because of Jesus. And, um, so anyway, um, they were, uh, working on her and we were saying goodbye to her, you know, all of us kids. And, uh, so, um, that was that, you know, and, uh, anyway, we prayed that the Lord would spare her life, you know, and to make matters worse, she got the flesh eating disease from being in the hospital um, they had to, uh, her skin turned black on her left, on her right, on her right side, her, her right side turned black and it was a disease that was eating her skin. It was horrible. And they started to do surgery on her and they would take uh, skin off of her legs to do skin grafts on her side. And they showed me, uh, they lifted up the covers and I could see her ribs. I thought, man, is that ever, that's just bad. That's really bad. And I was like, uh, God, you need to take her home, man. This is really bad. And, but yet I wanted her to live, you know, more than anything. So I was just like confused, you know, I, I just, I didn't know what I wanted, you know? So anyway, um, she was definitely in, they put her into an induced coma so she could heal. So anyway, uh, in the meantime, my dad was starting to come, but he would start coming drunk. And my dad had, did not drink for years. And that was the first time I saw him drunk and he was weeping over her. And all this anger of him beating on her got me so angry. Like, I just wanted to push him off of her, like, leave her alone. At least let her die in peace. But no, you got to be over her crying like a little baby, you know. I was thinking, all, you know, all sorts of wicked things like that, you know. Having no mercy on him, you know. As a matter of fact, I got pleasure out of him crying like that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's good to see you cry, you know. You're finally weak, you know. And so, anyway... Um, that's how things were for a while. They had to, they had to kick him out of the hospital because he was coming there drunk 
and us kids we didn't trust him with her because i don't know what he's what he's whispering to her you know and things like that and so anyway um we um she was that way for probably about a month and at that time we were dis discussing if we should shut off the machines and um my dad of course didn't want to do that so um anyway um i i went to the hospital as usual to try and talk to her because they encouraged us kids to talk to her while she was uh in that coma they said oh she can still hear you she she knows what's going on and so that's what we did so one day when i walked in there this nurse she met me and she says i have a surprise for you i was like really she's like yeah she goes come check it out so i went in there my mother was sitting up and she was eating and she's like hi alice and i was like wow they have they have voice it was the most beautiful voice it was like music that i've never heard it was so beautiful and i started praising god i'm like thank you for for letting her come back and i i really thought there you know she was gonna make it you know i really thought she was gonna succeed over this cancer and i went over by her and i i wasn't able to tell her how much i loved her because she was in a coma then I realized I had the chance to do that. And I went over by her and I was like, Mom. And she smiled at me. She's like, Hi. And I went over by her and I thought I was going to say all these things to her, but I didn't. I put my chair right next to her and I, um, I, um, what did I do? I held her hand. And that's all we did. We didn't say anything to each other. We just held on to hands. And I kept rubbing her hand like this. And I didn't I didn't know what to say. I just there were no words to express, you know, and I was like maybe I should tell her I should love her or maybe I should tell her. And I was like I I just couldn't. So my other sisters came and they were crying. They, they couldn't believe it. Mom looked normal. She was like she told me uh she says, Alice, she goes, um, I'm ready to go home. And I just looked at her. I'm like, Mom, you got too much morphine. And yeah, you're not going anywhere. I said, did you see your side? She goes, so what? She goes, I'm going to go home. She goes, help me to pack. And she started to get out of bed. I, I'm like, it was so hard because now I was, I was playing the parent. I had, to, uh, I had to correct my mom. I was like, Mother? You're staying in bed and you can't go anywhere. She says, no one's going to tell me what to do. She goes, I'm going home. And I'm like, and then I had to call for the nurse. And I was like, nurse, I said, uh, you need to help me. She's, she's trying to leave. And she's like, Judy, that was my mother's name. She's like, Judy, you can't go. You have to, um, you have to stay in bed. So she did. She sat back down and. So we were talk. I was trying to, you know, get her to talk to me. And I'm like, what do you want to eat? She goes, I want a sandwich. Because she hadn't, you know, eaten in so long. They were feeding her through the tube. So she um, <clears throat> she asked for a, a, a liverworth sandwich. And so we actually snuck one into her for her. And she ate it. And we she asked for orange pop. So we snuck that in too. She was on a strict diet, so we weren't allowed to, she wasn't allowed to have certain things, but we, we snuck in stuff for her because <laughs> she was craving it because she didn't have these things for a long time. And so anyway, um, I don't know. She was, she was active for about three weeks. We we're all planning for her to come home and the doctors, they were in amazement. They said, we don't know what's keeping your mother alive your mother has so many things wrong with her we're scratching our heads as a matter of fact he says uh, we have a team of doctors that are going to be studying her they had five uh, interns uh, doctors and I remember them all being around her and they were talking to her they were examining her body and I knew that I knew that it was Jesus Christ 
that was keeping her alive. I knew that. And I was praising God for it, you know. I was ready for her to come home with us. So they asked for permission to take pictures of her, of her, the flesh-eating disease, so that they could study it. So we gave permission for them to do that, and that's what they did. They took uh, Polaroid shots of her. So <clears throat> anyway, I went to school again at the university there in Baraboo when I was sitting in class. And I got a phone call from my sister, and she said, it's it's time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, Mom is in a coma again, and, and this is going to be the last time. So I was like, oh, geez. Man, I, I kept asking the Lord to to heal her, and I knew the Lord could heal her. And I knew it was totally up to him. And I knew that I, I didn't want to get mad at Jesus. Either he's going to take her home or he's going to heal her 100%. But either way, by um, his stripes, we are healed. And I and I knew that. So I was prepared to face the music, and I was prepared to, uh, to let her go. So we went up to the ICU unit, and the whole family was there. You know, everybody was there. And we were around her bed. And I looked at the nurse, and she was looking at us, and she had this this uh, clipboard and she gave it to my sis my older sister because she was the one that was in charge of her of her health uh, because my mother was not able to care for herself and um, we looked at each other and I looked at my sister and I went like this and uh, she signed the paper and she gave it back to the nurse and the nurse went over and she shut off the machines So, everybody, I just praise Jesus, everybody had their turn to say goodbye. It was precious. Everybody had their turn, and I just praise God that he allowed that to happen. He, he, so, we said to the doctor, okay, the machines are shut off. When is she going to go? He said it could be two seconds, two minutes, two hours, two months. We don't know. And I said, okay. So I'm like, well, Lord, I know you're merciful. I know you're not going to let her suffer like that. So I trust you. So we were all around her. We did the Last Supper with her. We put a itty bitty piece of bread in her mouth. And my uncle, uh, he passed out the grape juice. And we put a little bit of grape juice in her mouth. And we all prayed. And my uncle said, okay. He says, the machines are shut off. He said, so. Now we're going to trust Jesus because Jesus, he's either going to take her home or he's going to heal her. Those are the two options that, that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're all waiting for her to go and she's still alive. You know, she was breathing really heavy and, and uh, it was tough to see my dad cry. It was tough to see my brothers cry, but through it all, Jesus was with us and, so I had this urge to uh, go and uh, eat. I was really hungry. I didn't. I I realized I have not eaten in a long time. So I said to my siblings, "I'm gonna go eat." And they're like, "What? I, I'm hungry. I haven't I haven't eaten like in two days, you know." So they said, "Okay." So I went downstairs, you know. I went down there. Here there was this long. Um, a square table because they were doing remodeling down there in the cafeteria at the time so it was a wooden long table and I was thinking it's just like the Last Supper you know where Jesus invites us to eat with him and, and to share the fruits and stuff and so I was sitting there eating all of a sudden my whole family came down and I said to my brother I said who's up there with mom and he says um, so-and-so is up there, you know, and I said, okay, so my mom's brother was there when my, we were all sitting at, at the table and I went like that to my brother Buckley and I said, Buckley, I said, this, this is, this is just like the last supper, isn't it? He says, yeah. So we were sitting there and we're actually laughing and it felt so good to laugh. I haven't done that in a long time, you know, all of a sudden, um, uh, we heard cold, cold blue, Cold blue with the cloud family 
come up to the ICU unit immediately. And we all quit. We all quit laughing. And I knew that was it. And I looked up. And when I looked up, I saw my mom. And... She didn't have those tubes in her, but she still had on her hospital gown. But I could see just half of her. And on each arm, she had two uh, angels to her, and they were lifting her arms up, and she was floating up. And I was looking, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And she turned around, and she looked, and she couldn't believe. She, I knew that she knew all of us were there. And she was like, she didn't know what was going on. She was like, oh my gosh, my whole family is here because my mother was a very family oriented woman. And uh, that angel said to her, he said, Judy, he goes, we have to go. And she looked up at that angel and she went like this. So I told my brother, I said, Buckley, mom knows we're here. And he says, what? I said, mom knows I just saw her. And he's like, come on. He says, we have to go up there. So we went up there, and we were all walking together. And I knew Jesus was with us, you know. And I grabbed my brother's hand, and I squeezed it, and I said, um, I said, this is it. And he says, yeah, this is it. So I tried to prepare myself. And as we were getting closer and closer to the ICU unit, I could hear crying. Hmm. I heard crying, and uh, this nurse, she came out of my mother's room, and she said to me, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right. I looked at her, and I said, it's not going to be all right. It's not all right. This, this is not all right, I said to her. I kind of pushed her out of the way, and I walked in there, and sure enough, she was lying there, lifeless. And people around her were crying. And these people that were in the room with her, praise God, were the ones that were unsaved. I knew, I knew that they were meant to see that. And one of the people said, look, she has a tear coming down her eye. Sure enough, it looked like there was a, a tear that came out. And I took that tear and I wiped it off of her. And I said, Mom, no more, no, no more suffering. And I yelled at that nurse. I said, get these tubes off of her right now. And she's like, ma'am, I can't. We have to wait for, for, the, um, for the, the coroner people to come. They're the ones that will do that. I was like, I don't care. I, I started to take those out of her. I didn't want those in my, in my mom's body anymore because she's, she's a new creature now, you know. So that's, what, uh, that's how my mother left us, you know. She, uh, she went peacefully and... Uh, and, and and I knew that I knew that she went to heaven, you know, because she, she loved Jesus very much. My dad, Lionel, moved uh, mobile homes for a living, and we also had a, a junkyard. My mother worked at a factory, so us kids, we were never without food. My parents did the best that they could to take care of us. But there's also trouble in the home as well. I was uh, the baby girl of the family, so... I, my sisters and I, we had to take care of the three boys. They were babies then. 
It's kind of hard to do when you want to go outside and play, you know, but you got to you got to stay indoors and you got to help take care of the little ones, you know. And uh, since we didn't have running water, my mom would have to sneak to the Devil's Lake campground. She would take these uh, these milk cans and she would fill them up with water at the campground. We had to hurry up and uh, get water before security came. They caught us more than several times and they told us never to come back. So we had to sneak in there just to get water to drink. And we would also... My mom would um, tell us kids to hurry up and um, take a shower in the um, campground. She always brought along a bar of soap. She would have some shampoo and she would say, you girls, you got to hurry up and take a shower. Help your brothers. So we would go in there and take showers. I remember being scared because I didn't want to get caught by the campground security. So we would hurry, you know, and do what we had to do. And we got out of there and those milk cans were real heavy stake at all that you're watching this uh, precious testimony uh, today. And I pray that you would receive it with grace in Jesus' name. Well, as I told you, I'm Ho-Chunk, and I'm also Chippewa. My parents are Lionel and Judy Cloud. My dad is, an, is enrolled Ho-Chunk, and my mother is was enrolled in the Grand Travis Band of the Chippewa Odawa Indians in uh, Peshabi Town, Michigan. I grew up in Baraboo, Wisconsin, on an old farmhouse. This farmhouse was 100 years old, if not more. We had no running water, and uh, sometimes we would even go without electricity. And we had an old uh, outhouse. I have uh, six brothers and sisters, so I came from a very large family. I grew up near Devil's Lake in Baraboo, Wisconsin, but I was born in Northport, Michigan. Um, as some of you Native people can, can relate, I had a pretty uh, tragic childhood, a hard one. And it's not easy to talk about, but I know a lot of you Native people know what I'm talking about, the pain, the suffering, the low self-esteem. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ can take all of that pain and, and hurt just like that if you would let him. As I was telling you, I grew up in this house. It had a it was a two story home and we had lots of barns. And uh Father God, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your blood. I thank you for uh dying on the cross for me, Lord. Lord, I'm I'm unworthy of of your love, Lord, but Lord, you just reign in my life and I thank you, Father, for thy faithfulness and for thy greatness, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would use me for your glory and for your benefit, Lord. Father, I thank you for, for caring for me, Lord. I thank you for for being my best friend and I thank you for for loving me for who I am and for for who I am about to become. Lord, you deserve all of the glory. Amen. I wanted to start out very quickly with um, a little paragraph uh, from uh, Dr. Billy Graham had said this in 1976 about us Native people. And it goes, The greatest moments of Native history may lie ahead of us if a great spiritual renewal and awakening should take place. The Native American has been a sleeping giant. He is awakening. The original Americans could become the evangelists who will win America for Christ. Remember these people. Praise God. And it is now the year 2009. 
and us native people are still here. And I praise God that he has not forgotten the Native American people. We are the original Americans, and I praise God for that. The Lord Jesus has not forgotten us. And if you would just invite him, be willing to be open to the testimony that I'm going to give you. You're going to know that Jesus Christ is real and that he loves you. There's no mistake. The two demons, after they got done hooking me up, um, they backed away from me. They didn't turn around and back away. They were looking at me, walking backwards. making they, they got pleasure out of just looking at me, knowing that I was totally helpless, knowing that I could not get out of there. They knew that, and that gave them such pleasure. And as the fire of hell was, was roaring... <laughs> glowing about me I could see the outline and it was a massive audience of all sorts of deformities of demons and um, all I could see were their shadows and I kept looking and I wanted to scream for help but I didn't even have the energy to do that because I knew I was doomed I just I just knew I was doomed hello my name is Alice Cloud. I'm an enrolled Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. And um, I'm so glad you came across Precious Testimonies to hear uh, the testimony of, of my life. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ be given all the praise and, and honor and glory for what I'm about to tell you. And the reason why I'm giving you my testimony is because as Native people, I'm sure you can relate to me, uh, the troubled upbringing that we have as Indian people, but through Jesus Christ, we can have the victory to overcome. And um, you've been watching a series of testimonies in, in my home, and I welcome you today to uh, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I wanted to uh, uh, start out by uh, praying very quickly. It was hard for my mom to lift those and being so small I always wish I could help her lift those cans but I couldn't. So we would go home and sometimes uh, my dad would come home drunk you know and uh, that's when he would uh, beat my mother a lot. My mother was a, a Christian. She loved the Lord Jesus Christ very much. She uh, always tried to bring peace into the home. But my dad, he was always so rebellious against Christianity. He had a hard upbringing too, but uh, she was always praying, you know, for him. So, anyway, um, growing up on that, that farm, it was a lot of fun. I would uh, jump into the old the junk cars and I would play in them, you know. I was always outside, too, and if I wasn't watching my brothers, I was outside playing. And um, I would go in these junk cars and I would find just little stuff to play with all the time. And um, anyway... To get out of the house, my mother put us kids in a Awana club in church. Awana club is a is a like a Sunday school for kids, and that's how I was raised. I was raised knowing about Jesus Christ, and for me, it was in a way to escape uh, reality, because my dad would beat my mom a lot, and I had to be a witness to that. And there's also some sexual abuse with my older sister that she had to endure. And that was...